Pro race bikes have changed a lot in just 10 editions of Paris-Roubaix, so we thought we'd compare John Degenkolb's 2015 Rimbrake Giant Defy Advanced SL to Mathieu van der Poel's Canyon Aerode CFR and Lotta Kopecky's Specialized Tarmac SL8. Let's start with speed. Paris-Roubaix has got fast, and I mean real fast. When John Dagan Cobb won in 2015, the average speed was 43 and a half kilometers per hour. When Van der Poel won this year, the average speed was nearly 48 kilometers per hour. That's so much faster, and the bikes have changed with the speed. Dagan Cobb's 2015 winning bike was a choice made based on balancing speed and comfort. He chose Giants Defy. While not as fast as the team's Propel or TCR, it wasn't limited to 25mm tyres, which simply aren't big enough for the cobbles. With the modern aero race frames of Van der Poel and Kopecky, there is no such compromise. His Canyon Aerode and Hurt Specialized Tarmac SL8 can officially fit 31 and 32mm tyres respectively, though Van der Poel pushed this to the limit fitting 32mm tyres. Both the Aerode and Tarmac have deeper tube shapes, and the Aero features don't stop there. Van der Poel's Aerode has a fully integrated front end, removing any Aero drag that the exposed cables on Degenkolb's bike might have been causing. The flat tops of Van der Poel's adjustable CP0018 bar, set to 40cm width, will also be helping to save some precious watts. That said, Kopecky decided to go without her Roval Rapide integrated cockpit, choosing instead to use the stem from the SL7 and a mystery bar. To me, those drops look like those of Roval's Terra gravel bar, so maybe she's using a 38cm model. Let me know what you think in the comments. Whatever the case, both riders are much narrower at the front than Dagan Cobb's 2015 bike allowed. His Defy was set up with a 42cm Pro PLT bar, which is a size we rarely see in today's Pro Peloton. Along with the rest of his giant Alpecin team, Dagan Cobb raced the hell of the north on the previous year's bikes, the 2014 Giant Defy Advanced SL, because Giant spec disc brakes on its 2015 model, which at the time were forbidden by the UCI. The 2015 Defy with disc brakes was seen in professional competition later that year, as the UCI took the bold step of announcing that all teams would have the opportunity to use disc brakes at two events of their choosing during August and September. Under UCI testing, the gates were wide open for discs in 2016, with the idea being that if the experience was satisfactory, disc brakes would be officially introduced into the UCI World Tour in 2017. How times have changed. Van der Poel and Kopecky both rode bikes which have been exclusively disc brake only for a number of years now, and with tyre clearance exceeding the clearance allowed by rim brakes, we just can't see things ever going back. But I have to give a little nod to Dagan Cobb's additional crosstop brake lever. You just don't see them these days, and I have to say, I rather miss them. <laughs> Tyres seem to be getting wider every few years, and some riders in both the men's and women's fields were using tyres so fat that they'd be illegal in a UCI cyclocross race. Fred Wright used 35mm Continental GP5000 ASTR tyres, while Elise Shabby and Alice Towers in the Canyon SRAM team went even further, riding Schwab G1 Speed gravel bike tyres. Now, Dagan Cobb's tyres were pretty massive for their day at 30mm wide, but few brands were making tubular race tyres in this size on a production scale, so his are handmade just for this race. Vittoria simply glued clincher treads onto 30mm tubular casings. You can tell from the markings on the tyre sidewall, which suggests nearly twice the pressure of what riders use at Paris-Roubaix. Kopecky and Van der Poel both run 32mm tubeless tyres, with the former on specialised Mondo tyres which debuted at last year's race, and the latter is on a development of Dagan Cobb's tyres with the Vittoria Corsa Pro tubeless tyre. Again, Van der Poel used 32mm tyres, and the race told us two crucial things about his setup. The first came from the start line. 
We don't usually know what pressure the riders use, but footage from the start of the race showed the men's winner using 3.46 bar or 52 psi. For a rider that is listed as weighing 75 kilos on pro cycling stats, that is a seriously low pressure, which you might think heightens his chances of puncturing. But for the last two years, Van der Poel has come through the puncture fest with zero flats. The second nugget came just after the infamous Aremberg sector, when Van der Poel's teammate, Jasper Philipsen, suffered a rear puncture. He was filmed comfortably kind of bobbing down the road with the tyre seemingly holding on to a bit of pressure. This suggests that he, and we would assume Van der Poel too, was using tyre inserts, likely from tyre brand Vittoria, along with sealant. As the battered sidewalls of Degenkolb's tyres show, this is a brutal race on tyres. You can have all the tech in the world, sometimes a puncture is just simply luck of the draw. Taking a wider look at the pelotons of 2015 and today, a major tech shift has been away from tubular tyres to tubeless. Tubular was the pro tyre choice for years, and even last year some of the favourites chose them over tubeless. But those days appear to be gone. In this year's men's race, we only saw one team on tubular tyres. French team Cofidis used Michelin's Power Cup treads on specially made 30mm casings, as this isn't a size that the brand makes publicly available. Elsewhere, we saw countless 32mm tyres from a variety of brands. Movistar, FDJ, UAE and Ineos were all on Continental's GP5000 STR tyres. Alpecin, DSM, EF, Arkea, Visma, and some others were on Vittoria's Corsa Pro tyres, with just a smattering of riders on the slightly grippier control version, presumably to help them deal with the wet coppel sections. It could be easy to compare the 53-tooth chainring of Dagenkob and the 54-tooth that Van der Poel ran, and assume that not much has changed in the gearing department. But one look at Lotta Capecchi's bikes shows that one bike is now a big player on the cobbles. This isn't some thrown together setup either. SRAM has been developing its one bike gearing for a number of years now, and the setup not only works well, it looks pretty darn snazzy too. The world champion rode a 50 tooth chainring with an oil slick cassette in the rear, and obviously, you've got to match that with the oil slick chain. And I'd like to quickly mention the Ineos duo of Ben Turner and Josh Tarling. Turner had a 60 tooth chainring fitted and his teammate rocked up to the start line with a 62 tooth whopper. Oh. Now, before you think that's fine, they've got an inner ring to fall back on. Mm -mm. The Brits were rocking a one by setup with an 11 to 34 tooth cassette out back. The reason for bigger chainrings isn't just speed. Yes, the race seems to get faster each year, but many riders will be looking to maximise their drivetrain efficiency by keeping their chain at the bigger end of the cassette. It also looks pretty cool, which is obviously the whole point. So, which bike would you pick? One of the new aero machines or the old lightweight rim bike? Let me know in the comments below. As ever, if you haven't already subscribed, click the subscribe button, it's free. Remember to like this video and we'll see you next time.